Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for Minnesota Vikings. I'm your host producer. My name is James Pagoshny. Thank you guys so much for listening. And on the other end of the tin cannon string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from the wide left substack. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, that was definitely a football game. I don't one know kid. if you could I don't know if you could Are describe you? it as anything else other than a football game was played. It wasn't good. It was a facsimile of football activity, I think, is maybe even closer to accurate. So, I have to ask, you're staring down the barrel of a 59-yard field goal. Mm-hmm. Do you let him kick it? I mean, knowing now that he doesn't have the leg, sure, but, like, do you... Hey, Pinero's had a good year. I have him on one of my Hell League squads. Uh, and the penalty for a miss on a 59-yard field goal is only five. And the the benefit is huge. True. Do people understand? That's like it's like almost 100 points. Yeah, but... <laughs> so, yeah, was... I would. <laughs> you personally would on a fantasy situation. I do right. enjoy... Should, should the Panthers have... No. Uh, well, I mean, they, they managed third down pretty poorly, I would argue. <laughs> God, he he tried real hard to like throw a pick on that last drive too, like he was trying so hard to just. I was sitting and watching the fourth quarter, honestly asking myself, why am I watching the fourth quarter of this game? Is there nothing else on? I could I watch. Had... I could watch the. I could watch the last episode of this season of Loki, and probably enjoyed myself far more than what I got out of watching that Thursday night football game. I had uh, the over on DJ Moore receiving yards. Uh, the over under was 58 and a half. He had 58 entering the fourth quarter. I was like, okay, he just needs like one. K-. Actually, he hit 58 entering the halfway point of the third quarter. I was like, okay, I just need like one reception for positive yardage because the worst that could happen, obviously, is a reception for negative, right? That's totally on the table. It's like I, I'm probably good. This is we're probably fine. I'll just catastrophize a little bit in the group chat so that it happens, so that I can reverse jinx it into happening. So I did. I was like, he's going to catch a screen for negative two yards, but no, he just wasn't targeted. Like again, technically he was targeted on a throwaway, but yeah, I, he finished with fifty eight. And if everything, Panera everything had made that now. field goal, it would have been overtime. And I, we would have had a shot. The thing is, they did have to throw the ball, and they threw it to Darnell Mooney. Who cares about Darnell Mooney? That's crazy. Why would you target him? I know they got the first down. Why would you target him? <laughs> Why would anyone target Darnell Mooney? <laughs> Do you have DJ Moore at home? Is that it? Like, why? <laughs> Awful. It's necessary. Well, welcome to this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys are all doing well. We have a game to preview. Uh, Arif conducted an interview earlier today, so we'll be doing that about the Saints game. And we have the mailbag as well. But before we start, again, thank you guys so much for listening to Norse Code. If you enjoy the show and would like to help us financially, there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can head over to patreon.com slash Norse Code and donate there for $3.50 a month or a little less for the year subscription. You get access to bonus material. You get access to the Discord whole bunch of other stuff and uh i'm gonna work on trying to make it so that the people in the discord can listen to the show as we're recording it i don't know if it's gonna work oh, but i am no. gonna try so oh, no there uh there is that uh otherwise it will be edited and put out on uh for saturday morning for the for the weekend uh speak which is also to say that the live show is happening the damn grill 7 p.m november 17th Probably start the taping at about 7.30, but The Damn Grill in Denver, Colorado, 7 p.m., November 17th. Should be a lot of fun. We are giving away two tickets to the game, so check us out. We will be in Denver next week. The Damn Grill. Arif is looking to get free lunches, so we're, we're, gonna go, we're going to Denver for that. I tell yeah. one story about getting a free lunch, and now James is like, oh, Arif's like whole Raisin Datra is to get 
free food, which is not necessarily wrong. I'm not going <laughs> to, but come on. I mean, if I'm looking at this, like the last, um, the, between the two last two conversations we've had, including this one, a free, a free meal has come up three times. I'm just three? pointing that out. Okay. I don't believe you. I think you no. added one just to add one. No, uh, two today and <laughs> <No>. one <laughs> and one uh, last episode. Okay, well, I don't remember anything I say in a podcast. So no, we we we're we're very well established. You basically have to take my word on it until I actually play it for you. So yeah, <laughs> this is where we're at, folks. Uh, you can also, if you'd like to help us financially, you can go over to paypal.me slash norsecode as well. It's a one-time donation, or you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and get yourself some Christmas socks. Uh, the Ah Reef stuff is good all year round, quite frankly, especially if you would just like to send that to a Reef's brother. He would really appreciate more A Reef merch. We should That's just not like wrong. Set, <laughs> we should just set up like an Amazon like wish list sort of thing where like we have the address. <laughs> like, like, why do I have a shower curtain? Like it's great. Uh, it's he, great because he, he's got like glass sliding doors in his bathroom. For I was going to say because so. he's got that, and so it wouldn't actually work. <laughs> so he's just stuck there with like a plastic flag at this point. It'd be great. All right, well, let's get into the interview that uh, that uh, Adrif conducted earlier today. This is a preview of the Saints game with John Sigler. He writes for Saints Wire for USA Today. And uh, we'll be back with the mailbag in just a moment. All right, I'm here with uh, Jonathan Sigler from USA Today Saints Wire, uh, here to help preview the Saints. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think I've had you on the show before. We've been Twitter mutuals for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Vikings have played the Saints a lot. Figure might as well get somebody who knows what they're talking about uh, to uh, preview the Saints. Failing that, got you. How are you doing? <laughs> Ross Jackson was busy, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, no, I asked you first. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, man. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Um, so uh, I admittedly have not been following the Saints closely this year. I figure, you know, the NFC South, it'll figure itself out. I don't got to look into that mess. Um, something will happen by the end of the year. It'll be an NFC South team. And that's just kind of how I feel about it. I don't need to know that much about what's going on. But now the Vikings are actually playing the NFC South. And so uh, I've neglected things. I know that they've signed Derek Carr. I know that uh, some people, who's to say, made some mistakes about which tight ends we'll be picking. We'll talk about <clears> that. <throat> yeah. Uh, and that defense is like pretty good, I guess. So we'll talk about all of that. Uh, but first, I think we do just want to talk about Derek Carr. How is he doing? Is the deep ball broken? Uh, was he just kind of a bust of a signing? Are we still optimistic about the signing? And hey, everyone likes Jake Hayner. What's going on there? <laughs> yeah, man, we, we love uh, we love Derek Zoolander. He's he's a great um, you know QB four uh, who, who doesn't uh, who doesn't even dress on Sundays. It, it, it's awesome. Um, yeah, so I hate to say this going into week ten, the jury is kind of still out on uh, Derek Carr as far as whether this is going to work out long term or not. Um, you know, he, he's had some very, some very uh, productive games and there have been some very long stretches where you're like, this dude is making rookie mistakes in his 150th NFL start. Like he, he he's getting frazzled. He, he's not getting off his first read. Um, there was one play a few weeks ago against uh, the Jags where it was, oh gosh, it, it kind of went viral. I, I, I guess where, he air, he airmailed this ball to Chris Olave down, down the sideline and then was screaming at, at the kid after the play. And come to find out, Olave wasn't even like in play there. Like like he was running a decoy route to free up Taysom Hill. And Carr got so locked on Hill that he he neglected to read the field and you know go go to Rashid Shahid or Michael Thomas and he he, he just threw it in Carr's general Olave's general direction and then freaked out at him screaming after the play and. It was this whole thing, man. It, that that really the, the grip that that incident had on Saints Wire or, or on Saints Twitter <laughs> uh, for a few days was out, outrageous. Um, you know, after the game, you you had Carr going, "Oh no!" While well, I was it yelling at him, and the, and then the Vikings or then the uh, the Jags players who were mic'd up caught caught him uh, on on a hot mic, uh, just ripping into the second year receiver, and it's like, my guy, you are not playing well enough to be talking to people like this. But <laughs> yeah, in, anyway. Um, all, all that said to say, Carr has been playing better as of late, um, much more efficient. Um, I, I think Rashid Shahid had the most efficient game a receiver could possibly have um, against the Colts uh, a 
a couple weeks back. He, he was only targeted three times. He was only in the game on 18 snaps. He was targeted three times. He caught three passes for 153 yards in the touchdown. I, I mean, it was like a, it was like Randy. It's like the, you know the the famous uh, Randy Moss stat line. I, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's outrageous. And Shahid is probably his favorite deep threat. That that's the guy he's always looking for downfield. Um, he's the one who twice in games this season we've seen Carr go to him in the late in the fourth quarter uh, for uh, for the dagger to put put a team away. And so he has a lot of trust in, in this guy, and it's. We're just kind of waiting to see if he can develop that same trust in Chris Olave and, and you know, throw better football to Michael Thomas. So, you know, it, it's it's frustrating to – because when the Saints signed him, the, the line was, oh, here, here's a Pro Bowl quarterback. Here's somebody who has seen it all, done it all. He, he, he knows life in the NFL. He knows the highs and the lows, and he's seen every defense we can throw at him, and he's going to get this offense, you know, ship shape. And we're going into Week 10, and, I mean, they're struggling to score 24 points a game. And that's just the reality here. So, so when, when you say the jury is out, that implies that there's also like some pretty, po- I mean, this sounded all pretty negative. It implies there's some pretty positive stuff in there too. Oh yeah, dude. Like he is the ideal quarterback for Alvin Kamara as far as, you know, checking the ball down, throwing an accurate ball specifically that, uh, it, especially on these timing routes. Um, that's something that we've, that other quarterbacks in this offense have really struggled with in recent years. Trevor Simeon couldn't do it to save his life. Um, Andy Dalton has struggled to, to, to hit those passes. Ja- Jameis Winston got benched because he couldn't hit those passes. I mean, that, that was a major factor there. And so in, in comes Carr and Kamara. I mean, Kamara, he, he's catching 12 passes, 13 passes a game. Um, obviously, you don't want to do that all the time. But to have someone who can access that talent, uh, you know, not quite to the level that Drew Brees did, but to get something out, out of, you know, in my, in, my, in my opinion, the best receiving back in the NFL, um, that 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 is awesome, and Carr needs to keep that he needs to keep that up. The Saints need to continue doing a good job of you know drawing up you know good routes for for AK instead of just having him you know waddle out into the flat. Um, you know we we had a, this really nice Texas route uh, against the Colts, and I think they brought it back against the um, the Bears last week as well. So Carr is really doing an awesome job of weaponizing AK, and hopefully he can he can keep that up uh, here against Minnesota. Uh, so uh, we might as well transition that conversation to uh, Alvin Kamara and the running backs. But just real quick before we do that, the reason you call Jake Hanner QB4 is because of Taysom Hill, right? Yeah, yeah. T- dude, this is the year of Taysom Hill, I guess. Um, as far as you know, his overall usage um, in this offense, we, we haven't seen it like this before. Um, in, in, I think you were kind of alluding to his rushing ability here, and that, that's really come into form this season. He broke out last year as a runner. He averaged six yards a carry last year, and he, he's picked up right where he left off, and the, the offense has been better for it. Isn't he like 33? Yeah, dude, dude, he's older than me, yeah. Yeah, he's 33. <laughs> um, and and he, he's out here He's out here running like a 23-year-old on, on a, a UDFA contract, and, and he, he, he's running hard, and he... he he, I, I kid you not. Like he is their most explosive uh, threat as a as a runner right now. He 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 had a twenty yard touchdown run against against the Colts, and that was that remains the longest run from scrimmage the Saints have had all season. Um, yeah, okay, that that gives us a good opportunity to talk about Alvin Kamara, right? Because he has over a hundred yards from scrimmage per game, right? But it does not seem like a very efficient back right now like it seems like so obviously his yards per carry is down i think this is the lowest of his career 3.6 um his yards per target which i know is not like the best statistic in the world uh is is really low i think his yards per out run is quite low um you've mentioned you know car knows how to use a running back as a check down to me i think that car just likes checking it down oh yeah but uh, but he, he, he checked also, it down on a hail mary at, at 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 the end of the first half last oh, week. Oh god! Like oh sweet like, Kirk Cousins. Yeah, dear God, <laughs> yeah, Kirk, Kirk Cousins um, without a without a playoff win. Yeah. <laughs> um, playoff win came against the Saints. I yeah, know. yeah, hey, I wasn't I wasn't going <laughs> to specify. Now, come on, come on. Hey, 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 we're talking about Alvin Kamara. That's He's right. Dealt <laughs> known level of trauma to uh, to the Vikings, as it were. So, um. Is there, I mean, does it feel like he's lost a little bit of his juice? Like, technically, he's a very good route runner, but does it feel like it's just not there? Or is it a blocking issue? Is it an offensive design issue? He's getting, like, great volume, but, like, it does not seem like it's worth much. 
Yeah, dude, I, I think he's lost a little bit of that juice out in the, out in open space. Um, I mean, j- j- just look at it. Um, God, he is, yeah, he, he's twenty eight, so he'll catch up to me one of these days. But but he, he's he's twenty eight. He's had over twelve hundred carries in in the league at this point. Um, it wouldn't shock me at all if there's a bit of that in play where he's just not able, to, you know, m- m- make. He can still make the first defender miss, but he, he he's not making the second guy miss like we saw earlier in his career. He's not really bouncing off of defenders quite as much out in space. Um, he has never really been a running, uh, you know, a runner with long speed. He's never. He, I, I think I think he ran like a four six or something. He, he he doesn't have that extra gear that someone like, like Jonathan Taylor does, for example. Um, and so he he really has to rely on what the what the blocking can do for him to you know open a lane. And you know, let him shake the first defender, and and and, and then see what, what we can make after that. And the blocking has really taken a step back in New Orleans. They, they they've not hit on several pr- pretty high profile draft picks along the offensive line in recent years. Um, it took Caesar Ruiz three and a half years to to develop into you know a, a starting you know quality right guard. Uh, Trevor Penning is is on the bench right now. Um, and they've had three different left guards uh, start games this year, so. It, it, it's pretty rough, and the, the, the blocking hasn't been there. The play calling has been highly suspect. Um, one of my biggest gripes with how AK has been used is w- when they do design uh, running plays for him, it, it, it's just, uh, you know, two yards in the cloud of dust. They're, they're running him right into the teeth of the defense. And earlier in his career, we saw him take more runs outside the tackles, but bouncing outside, had, had more one, one cuts uh, to get to get out around the formation. And we just have not seen that same creativity in recent years, and that's been to his detriment. And he's paired with uh, noted anime enjoyer Jamal Williams. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, how is uh, which Williams' role now that like Kamara's back in the lineup? Because he didn't start the year in the lineup, right? So it's Jamal Williams primarily, and then and now he's a he's a backup. So how does that? Is he still worked in, or is he just somebody that's going to stay off on the sideline? until like Kamara definitely needs a rest or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jamal Williams is still getting his, his reps. Um, it's kind of interesting. They've been using him a lot on passing downs lately, or, or maybe it's just, seen, it just, you know, seems that way to me. Uh, let me, let me check the numbers right quick. Um, because he's been getting a lot of work in pass protection, which, which I think is interesting, but that's also something I was kind of looking for. Uh, cause, cause if you go back to earlier in his career, he was there, he was the third down back in green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, Like that, that was his guy. Um, and he kind of had to develop into that more physical run first back. And and, and so th- this is kind of a role that he's suited pretty well for. Um, let me see here. Yeah. Yeah. So he he's, he's had like uh, 15 pass blocks in the last few weeks. He hasn't given up any pressures. He, he he's helped create some plays. He's, 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 he's been an asset in that phase. And um, man, so he had, he also has not been, you know, super efficient. In, in his use, in his usage, which I think we kind of expected, because so much of his productivity last year came in the red zone. You know, as as, as uh, you know, scoring those those t- the the touchdown runs. You know, seventeen times or however many it was. I know I know he led the league, and you know, like like I mentioned with Kamara, the the offensive line has really struggled early on this season. They they leveled out a bit in recent weeks, but on the whole, they they've been a major problem for the offense. And I, I think that that that's hurt his game. That's hurt his produ- his production. Something else too. He recently came back from an injury. He, he went down in week two with a with a with a. Uh, I think he pulled his hamstring, and he, he was out for the next four five, four games. And so he's just now kind of getting back in, in, into a you know a decent snap count. Um, I'm looking at it now. He play, played 27 snaps last week, 15 the week before, 20 before that. So he, he's he's a part time player. He's not someone I would anticipate would make a huge impact in this game. Uh, but but he's part of the offense, and maybe most interesting to me, and something I would love to talk about is. is He's the back in their short yardage um, sets, or, or yeah, yeah, there's their short yardage package, which has Taysom Hill, has two o- offensive linemen uh, b- brought in as, as uh, eligible receivers, as extra blockers, of course, and then Colin Saunders is coming in as the wait what? Yeah, he's the fullback man. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, sure. Why not, man? Yeah, the, 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 I think the Ravens do it the same way. That they have a quote unquote fullback who's like three twenty four or something. But anyway, um, Saunders has been awesome in that role, uh, he, he, and which makes sense because he, he's done it since high school. He did it in college. Um, I believe he had a he had a rushing touchdown and a receiving touchdown in college at, at Western Illinois. I, I believe that's I, I think that's right. And Saunders has been 
and, and, and Jamal Williams is a running back in this package. And that makes sense, too, because he and Taysom Hill were together in that RPO heavy system at BYU way back when. So he and Taysom have a really great chemistry. Uh, th- th- they've been very effective together in the, the short yardage, yardage sets. Even if uh, Jamal Williams is doing a lot of blocking in that role, he, he's doing a lot to help Taysom Hill spring out it, it, <clears throat> in, into the open field and make some big plays. And he, he's been a positive player, just maybe not in the ways that we anticipated when the Saints signed him. Okay, yeah. Um, so with all of that, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about that offensive line. Um, you mentioned that Trevor Penning is benched. I assume he just keeps punching people or something. He's uh, not. That's the problem. Like, like, like <laughs> He's not. Yeah, dude, like they're just running past him and it's it's like get get low my, my guy. <laughs> so it's not even like it's not even like uh, an attitude thing or like an over aggressiveness thing. It's like he's not making yeah. contact with defensive linemen. Yeah, it, it's technique related. Like he he's really struggling with leverage. He he he's not getting low enough in his stance. Um and his feet are just it's it's uncoordinated. It, it it's it's really a practice thing, I think where maybe that wasn't a point of emphasis at was it Northern Illinois, Northern Iowa, Northern Iowa. Yeah. 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 Um, <clears throat> I don't think that was much of an emphasis at that, that at that level um, from, from his coaches. And then he missed, you know, almost his entire rookie season, you know, when he, he hurt one foot in preseason and missed most of the year, came back into the season by, hurt, by hurting his other foot. And so, everyone in the organization has been talking about this, like, okay, this is really his, his rookie year because he, he's actually able to practice now and he's able to, you know, receive coaching and be receptive to it and do film, film room work and actually put things into practice rather than just, you know, stand on the sideline on, on, on a scooter and watch everybody else get to work. So th- that, that's a work in practice um, or a work in progress, excuse me. And it, it's, it's all technique related. And I, I think he'll be fine. He has all the physical gifts I mean, he was an RAS god. Um, he and to his credit, you know, I, the the aggression and the throwing guys all over the place and getting ejected in practice, all all that stuff that that was kind of his signature. Um, I mean, I joked about him, you know, throwing dudes around after the whistle at the Senior Bowl and whatnot. That hasn't really been a problem for him. I, there there was at one, there was one point where he he was like one of four offensive tackles around the league who had, who had not been penalized uh, on more, like 25 on like 250 snaps or something. Like he, he's been doing a great job of reining that in during games, not getting baited into penalties and, you know, not being, a, not being a negative in that area. So, so now that he's done, that tells me that he is coachable, that he can, you know, unlearn bad habits and be, be mindful on the field and work on his craft. And, and I, I think he'll be fine in the long run. I, the Saints really can't afford for him not to be, you know, given everything they invested in him. Um, but I wouldn't anticipate him, you know, playing much if, uh, against the Vikings. And it will probably take a while before he's able to be a, you know, a productive starter in this offense. So the guy who's starting is Andrus Pete, right? <laughs> yeah, dude. Okay, so this was completely unexpected. So Pete took a pay cut to avoid being released as a cap casualty in the spring. Um, and he, he's been starting at left guard in the last five years. He hadn't started a game at left tackle since 2018, I believe, or the end of the, tw- yeah, it was like the end of the 2018 season. Um, and so the story with Andrews Pete all summer was, okay, is he, are they going to trade him? Is he going to make it through training camp? Um, it, w- w- what's the plan here? And he lost his, his job, his job at left guard to James Hurst at the start of the season. And then, you know, Penning got benched. And the Saints like Hurst better at guard than at tackle. And all of a sudden, Andrew Speed is starting at left tackle, and he's actually holding it down. And all of a sudden, this guy who had to take a pay cut, who was who, who got benched, is suddenly looking like, oh man, he might be like a must-sign free agent for this team here, here in March. It, it's so bizarre. Such a bizarre career arc for this guy. That's wild. I remember when the Saints gave him that first contract a while back, and I was like, this dude is like massively overpaid. This yeah, makes dude. Sense. Yeah, and and that was like an albatross around the Saints' neck for years. Like that's something that we that I've pointed to that that Saints fans have pointed to as like what were they thinking when they did this? And you know, I, I don't think he ever really justified that. I know he made a couple Pro Bowls off of you know probably off of name recognition for you know just being in, in the offense that Drew Brees was leading and you know dominating every week. But 
to his credit, he's turned into a really nice, you know, option at left tackle for these last few weeks. Uh, he gave up a lot of pressures against the Jaguars, but I mean, it's been cricket. It's been crickets for the last two weeks with, with, with him at left tackle and the Saints are better for it. All right. That's interesting. Uh, you mentioned that James Hurst won that competition. Uh, it sounded like you were a little bit surprised by that. I know he was a cap casualty in Baltimore, but I always kind of had a little bit of respect for him. Yeah, dude. Like, so I kind of thought about him as if he was like just a guy and he is, and, let me think. but you know, to his credit, he's been a really nice, like utility player for the saints. He, he has started games for the saints at left tackle, left guard, right guard. Um, during his time with the team, and he's, he's been kind of indispensable for them. Um, the reason I was kind of surprised that he won that job, that left guard to start the season, uh, just because it's just because I ex- I expected Andrew Speed to, to hold that down because he had done he had been doing it for so long, and I just wasn't expecting the Saints to make a change there. I really thought they wanted Hurst to be you know the next man up with pinning at left tackle uh, and Pete at left guard. And then they could kind of plug him in wherever they need to, you know, once disaster strikes. And I, I guess, <laughs> you know, technically, um, that, 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 and from a certain it's point of view, that's happened, kind of what's yeah. happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it was just a little, it was just a little interesting. Um, but he, you know, he, hey, ah, man, I, he's had some issues with his run blocking as of late, uh, just get, just getting moved around. I, I wonder if there's like an injury or something there. Cause I know he, he has a history of like wrist issues or something. Um, something with his arms, I know. And so I'm wondering if maybe something something is flaring up there because he, he's not been as effective a run blocker now as we saw last year uh, when, whenever he was starting at left tackle. So that's something that's kind of on my radar. Okay, and then you've got Eric McCoy, who I think his rookie year was like really phenomenal. I think mm-hmm. since then he's been fine, um, which is what made drafting Cesar Ruiz in 2020 like super confusing to me because I saw him as a center only guy. Um, and so I was wondering if they're going to move Eric McCoy to guard or anything like that after having such good years at center. Um, and for a while, it seemed like Ruiz was just like a bust. You're saying now that he's doing all right. Yeah. Yeah. He, dude, he is like a, a league average starting right guard right now. Like he, he's not necessary. He's not a liability. Um, he, he's also not someone that like the saints are looking to run behind. He, he, he's not throwing dudes or he's not, he's not Jari Evans by any means out, out there. Um, but he he's developed into just, you know just a solid starter and, and given how badly things were looking um, at one point, uh, earlier in his career uh, that that that's good growth to see from him you know we're we're ha- happy for him to, to to kind of find his way at the, at this point um, you know it was reported at the time he he was part of the Saints of their trade package uh, to Houston for Deshaun Watson back when that whole fiasco was unfolding um, because well because they didn't have the draft picks to but instead, of like, hey, we'll give you this guy we just drafted in the first round, and just try and sweeten the deal <laughs> a little bit. And um, obviously, the, the Houston didn't bite. Um, but it took it took a while for him it's to kind like of find his way. And, pick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they may, look, it, it, it's basically the same thing. It, it, it's it's you know it's a lightly it's a lightly used Tahoe. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can't promise you would have picked anyone better. Come on. <laughs> yeah, you know, t- 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 yeah. <laughs> You know, hey, if we couldn't pick someone better, then why, why, why could you? I mean, come on. I, I mean, T. T. Higgins was right there, but uh, uh, any, anyway. <sighs> but that that was, dude. The Saints have had some of the weirdest first round picks. Well, okay, game. so like the Saints, like obviously everyone talked about like how great that 2017 draft was. That is mm-hmm. years ago, right? It's like six years ago. It's half a decade ago. Yeah. Um, does it feel like they've been garbage since then, or like what's how do you, like obviously Olave has worked out. We're not going to include like undrafted free agents like Rashid Shahid. Don't know what to do with Michael Thomas, but I guess he was before 2017. Yeah. But like, um, does it feel like the drafting has just been bad, or, or are you like happy with like like Pete Warner and stuff? Yeah, um, let me think. So I would say that they're getting more production out of the recent classes. Than the guys that came before, like the, the entire 2018 draft class was a wash. They're all gone. Not a single one of them are, are on the team. Half of them aren't even in the league anymore. Uh, that, that that was a mess. And you know, you have the typical things happen where like day three picks don't work out, or you know, Sean Payton will you know overrate a you know a, a mid quarterback like Ian Book and spend the 133rd overall pick on him, and then he's cut a year later. Um, 
these things happen, but it's it's weird. So it's the Saints do their best work in the second and third rounds. I, I've found that, and like, because in, 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 <clears throat> look at their uh, picks these last few years. Okay, round two last year was Elante Taylor, who who was you know one of the better r- rookie corners last season. He's been starting in the slot for the Saints and playing very well this year. Pete Werner, he, he's going to take over from Demario Davis whenever he you know, whenever you know he he finally decides to stop beating up Father Time and retire. Yeah. Um, Werner is going to be the linebacker for this defense for a long time, I think. Um, Paulson Nadebo is play, he he might be the next J.C. Jackson dude, like like somebody who goes out and just gets a bag in free agency. Um, and he was a third round pick, so. <sighs> The same, they, they've just been so high variance since that 2017 class. And I think what that may have done was it may have, it may have built their confidence up a little too high. Maybe they had, maybe they had too much dip on their chip after that point. And so they're like, oh, sure. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll draft um, the center from Michigan. Te- we'll teach him how to play right guard. We'll, excuse me, we'll draft this, uh, you know, okay, so... <laughs> So we drafted one, um, you know, tex- from a one Texas-based, um, injury-prone, oversized uh, defensive end in Marcus Davenport. That didn't work out. Let's do it again with Peyton Turner, and that also has not worked out. And so they they tend to gamble a little too much. Uh, look at the twenty-two draft where they, you know, oh God, H- Howie Roseman, you know, threw out his fishing line, and Mickey Loomis took the bait, and. <laughs> With, with the Trevor Penning thing and where they traded that uh, last year's or well, they traded the 23 pick to get that extra first rounder in 22 for Trevor Penning and Howie Roseman initiated those trade talks. Like that's something that Mickey Loomis talked about after, right after the trade was like, Oh yeah, Philly, Philly came to us with this great offer. And we wanted to, we felt like we could get, we could get another player who could help us out right away and, you know, be, be a good, be a good starter for us for a long time. And then they spent that on Trevor Penning who didn't play as a rookie who's benched right now who's not going to be ready for a while. And they're just not really in sync, I, I guess, with the draft day plans versus the long-term plans. And, and they're gambling where they maybe should be, you know, maybe playing it a bit more safely. Um, it, it's, it's kind of concerning in, in, in the long view because you want those guys to be working now. You know, but look, they, they got, I will say they, they found a player in, in the later rounds this year. Uh, which I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate. That's a uh, Jordan Howden, a uh, Minnesota Golden Gophers legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. go Gophers. Yeah, 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 dude. And he has been awesome in the dime package. He has started uh, two or three games now at free safety. You know, in, in place of Marcus May when he when he was suspended for a few weeks. And they're talking about him like hey, he's going to be the future at this spot, and he might be because Marcus May and Tyron Matthew are going to be entering a contract year in the spring. So he he could totally be starting for the Saints soon. That wouldn't shock me one bit. And he he was a fifth round pick, 146 overall. And so, you know, they, they just need, they need to maybe not gamble so much and kind of maybe try and play it safe for a few years and, and just, just draft good players. Don't, don't, don't try and project everything. All right. Well, uh, I mean, one player that was pretty safe, Ohio State receiver, Chris mm-hmm. Olave, mm-hmm. you know, as safe as you can get in, uh, in a draft context, uh, was a rookie of the year candidate. I, he didn't get rookie of the year last year. That was Garrett Wilson. Uh, he was robbed. Close. He was yeah, robbed. I'm, I'm sure he was, bud. I'm sure he was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was good. Uh, I'm not hearing as much about him this year. I kind of expected him to lead the team in receiving. And technically, he is, right? He's got like 20 more yards or something than Rashid Shahid. Mm-hmm. But uh it feel I feel like I would have I would have pegged the difference between one and two to be a little bit larger than that. Um, can you tell me about this receiving core? I know you've got a fake quarterback at tight end. You've got a fake quarterback at receiver in Lynn Bowden. Um, I'm sure there's <laughs> another fake quarterback somewhere here that we can find too. But um, yeah, I mean, is is there AT Perry is a draft guy? Everyone, all the all the draft Twitter guys love AT Perry. What what does this receiving group look like? What is what is Michael Thomas right now? Uh, and is Chris Olave like a genuine threat in the confines of the per- this particular offense? Yeah, so Olave and Carr have really struggled to stay on the same page. They, they, they've had some games where they've been super productive, and and, they, and Carr's throwing a good football. Olave's making a great catch and make, make, making a nice play. That's just that just hasn't happened often enough. You know, we're we're seeing th- issues like I'm trying to think like. Um, 
okay, the, the Colts game is a good example. So Olave didn't run his route to the, the like, or he broke off his route at too short of a depth for what Carr was planning on the shot down the seam. And it, and it kind of, it, it, the ball literally bounced off of Olave's helmet. And it, it, was, it was an incompletion. And th- th- everybody was frustrated. And so, but, you know, then they go back to, they go back to Olave on the next play and Carr throws it high and behind him. And, and it's an incomplete pass and they have to punt inside Colts territory. And th- that's kind of, my, that, that's, that's just two plays, but it, it it really does demonstrate like these two guys, they're, they're not communicating effectively. They're not in sync, but they're trying to make it work. Like Olave has 85 targets this year. That's more than anybody else on the team. Michael Thomas is second with 62. Um, he, he does lead the team in receptions. He's got 50 of them, uh, but his success rate is down this year. His catch rate is down this year. His, his uh, dot is down a little bit as well. Um, it's just not as effective. It's not as effective, not as not as efficient as we anticipated. And he he's a player who over the summer was you know the Saints were talking him up like hey he's he's going to be a huge player for us this year and he, he's going to he might he might have fifteen hundred receiving yards like he, he's going to be a huge part of what we're trying to do and they're trying so hard to make it work and there's just that disconnect there between the, the QB and the receiver and it's led to you know far too many negative plays so you know without being you know, at the facility, be, be, being on the practice field, I, I can't really guess at what the disconnect is, but they've, they've got to get that figured out because there's too much riding on both of these guys for it to fail. Is he is he as good as a 1500 yard receiver? Is it all because of a disconnect or like? I think so. Like we saw it last year, where I mean, look if if Andy Dalton can get the ball to him and help him be a be a, be a thousand yard receiver, then you know. Kara should be able to do, to at least do that. And if he's as big of an upgrade as the Saints tr- try to sell him as, then yeah, he totally should should go the distance. So he, he's been stuck in the sophomore slump, and it's just something that you know they, they've got to work out and, and get over and f- figure it out. It's 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 kind of baffling to see given how su- successful Olave has been up until now. I, I mean, he he owns the record at Ohio at Ohio State for touchdown catches, and. I mean, it's like, okay, he didn't have these problems with, you know, Andy Dalton and Jameis Winston and all, all of his quarterbacks who went to get dra- went on to get drafted out of Ohio State. Like, what is Derek Carr doing differently that's not meshing with this kid? What, what, what's going on there? And that's kind of the question that nobody seems able to answer. Fair enough. Uh, what is a Michael Thomas? Hmm. So he is a, you know, he's a decent, like, possession receiver right now. And that's probably more than we expected for him to have been away for, for so long. Like he, he missed most of three years <laughs> with, with all those different yeah. injuries and setbacks. And it took so long for him to even to get back on the field. Uh, but he's playing well, you know, he, he's getting open. He's, he, he shook the, uh, the, the, the poor Jalen Johnson out of his boots at one point last, last week, um, even though he didn't get targeted because Carr was looking the other way. But he, he he's he's playing well. I, I think with a QB who was doing a better job of more actively surveying the field, I think Thomas's numbers would be up. But I'm I'm, I'm happy with where he's at. You know, I don't think he's ever going to be someone who leads the league in rece- receptions and yards and everything again. But he can still be a good player in this league. And you know, given all of you know just all the adversity that he's had to deal with these last few years, I th- I think that's a win. Uh, and uh, and At Perry is he is he lived up to everything all the draft Twitter people said or is he just like a six round pick? Um, so he's been active for two games. Um, all right, good for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, primarily as a run blocker. Um, that's that's kind of what I expected. He's like six four, right? Like that's the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, he's, okay. he's six four, two fifteen. Um, obviously, he was so productive at that Wake Forest. But that's kind of what I expected looking at it. Like, he, com- coming out of school, he didn't have any experience working in the slot. Like, he almost exclusively lined up at that split-in alignment um, in the same spot that Michael Thomas fills in this offense. So, you know, all, all respect to him and his college tape and everything, the Saints are not going to take Michael Thomas off the field to put, a, to put in A.T. Perry. That, that's, that's just not how that – that's not how that – the math does not math well uh, <laughs> in, in there. It's not mathing. Um but I, I, you know, I would like to see him get some targets. He he was he was pretty he was very effective in the preseason. Uh, he he does have a catch radius that nobody else seems to see right now, and I, I think he could help the team in some situations. But there's a lot he has to learn, just given how limited his role was at Wake Forest. Uh, 
and with the veterans ahead of him right now, I, I just don't see him getting those opportunities. All right, so on my dynasty team, Juwan Johnson was my starting tight end. Oh, no. I was really excited about him. And though it would be dishonest for me to say that I picked him because of you, <laughs> I'm going to blame you anyway. Please do. Uh, Please do. Yeah. Which, uh, what's the deal? Yeah, yeah. So I, I owe everybody for this one. So there was so much hype behind Juwan Johnson and Derek Carr over the summer. I, I mean, he, there, there were interviews at training camp where Carr was, you know, mistakenly calling him Darren Waller because he, he's that exact, you know, type of tight end that he that he was playing so well with uh, with the Raiders, where he's this big target. He's Such fast. engagement bait. Oh my god. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Yeah. It, it, it was a whole thing, and and and, and I and I took a hook, line, and sinker, man. And so I, all, all summer, all summer, people were asking me, okay, which tight end should I draft? Should it be Juwan Johnson or Taysom Hill? And I'm thinking, oh man, Juwan Johnson caught six, caught, he caught six passes in eleven on elevens today. You, you got to go with him. And and obviously the the the, uh, the fantasy points totals speak for themselves right now. Um, I, I, I'm I'm sorry for everyone that well I hurt for, yeah. for all for all the, the for all the the, uh, the the fantasy managers who are upset with me. I, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a lap. After I, I, I traded away Dawson Knox because of you, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, hey, I wouldn't have told you that because I saw him at Ole Miss and I knew better. Um, <laughs> so, oh gosh, but uh, yeah, dude. So, Juwan Johnson is—he's someone that I just can't let it go. Like, he feels like the guy who could have a huge, a really big second half for this team. He, he missed, I think, four games with, with this mysterious calf injury. He, he was dealing he was dealing with something in training camp that had him limited but he was still working and then he was warming up in week three for the bucks game and at the literally at the last minute like like the team was doing intros and he had to jog off into the locker room and we didn't see him for, for four weeks and he had some mysterious calf injury and he finally came back from it a few weeks you know pretty recently and he, he's been doing a lot of work as a blocker. Um, he has he, he's been targeted 19 times, so they're, they're trying to get the ball to him, you know, in, in the handful of games that he's been back. It's just going to take a while for him to kind of reestablish that connection, I think. But yeah, that, that's been you know a pretty big disappointment for, for Saints fans and, you know, fantasy football managers uh, nationwide. So Jimmy G is on the team, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, OK, what's, so Jimmy what, Gra- what's up with that, man? What, what in the world? I, I'm guessing somebody had a fever dream in July or something because dude, literally the first day of training camp, they announced, Hey, Jimmy Graham is back. And we're like, Oh, to, to retire on a one day contract. Surely. Yeah. Right. right yeah. yeah. That's where I was. But I'm like looking at this roster. He's like right there. Yeah. Yeah. Now he has been inactive since Juwan Johnson came back. They they, they they don't have a lot of snaps to go around between, you know, JJ Foster Moreau and Taysom Hill. And so Jimmy Graham has been the odd one out. And when he has been playing, it's really been as a as a run blocking specialist, which is shocking. Like I would never, I would never have in a million years predicted that Same I would Jimmy be- Graham. Yeah, dude, I, I would never have predicted in a thousand years that I would find a Jimmy Suit Graham. Suit the NFL to be called a receiver, Jimmy Graham. This guy, this guy, yeah, that there would be a run blocking fan cam of uh, Jimmy Graham <laughs> deep eating dudes. Uh, in November 2023, I would never have predicted that in a million years. And he's been inactive the last, two, you know, since Juwan Johnson came back. And I think they view him as kind of as a luxury. <laughs> so, okay, here's a funny stat for you, though. So Jimmy Graham has one catch this season, right? Uh, mm-hmm. For an eight-yard touchdown against the Patriots. Like, like he, he, he is one for oh, one. That's got to feel good, though. Oh, it does. It does. It, does. it yeah. was such a nice moment. But yeah. the, the reality has not lived up to, like... You know, the daydreaming, I guess, of Jimmy Graham finally coming back to New Orleans and finishing his career in black and gold and all this stuff. Like he, he he's the, the third or fourth tight end, the, you know, the blocking specialist. He, he's not really he's, he's like he's like Mercedes Lewis right now. I, I guess so. Well, well, even Mercedes Lewis is active. Like even he is like dressing on game days and get, but, getting, but he's like a run blocker. Everyone's like, yeah, remember when he caught passes and everyone else is like, no. <laughs> yeah, that's when the Jack. That's before the Jaguars updated their uniforms. Like it's it's been a minute. It's been a minute. But um, yeah. Dude, so J- Jimmy Graham, it's it's a great story. I wish he I wish that he was able to help out more often. Uh, but he's just not a factor right now. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the defense. We already talked like a a good chunk about the defense when we talked about the draft class. But uh, sixth place defense in uh, in EPA per play. Also, I I kind of don't 
like believe it. Uh, I'm not really sure what's going on with how good this defense is. Can you tell me about like what the defensive design is? What's making it effective? Um, is Paulson Adebo actually good or is it just bad quarterbacks? Uh, you know, I, Demario Davis, obviously, I'm not going to knock him. He's good. But like I, the rest of this defense, I'm just like, man, I don't know. Like Marcus May is fine. Tyron Matthews, is Tyron Matthew, but I don't know. I'm looking at this defense and I'm just thinking, yeah, I could see it doing okay. I can't see it doing sixth. What's going on? Yeah, so they are a very opportunistic defense and they're built around the secondary. Like they, they, Dennis Allen's, you know, platonic ideal of a play would be, you know, dropping six defend, dropping six or seven defensive backs into coverage, you know, rushing three and, and then making making the QB hold the ball for four or five seconds, and then making a mistake like that. That's that is it. His his vision of a good play, and that that works when you're playing some pretty bad quarterbacks. Um, that can be a problem whenever you're saying, "Okay, Trevor Lawrence, we're going to make you hold the football for five seconds and see what happens." And gosh, it, it, it's, it's backfired a bit. Uh, they are, I believe, have. They rank four. They're tied for the fourth fewest sacks at this point. Uh, they they just they have not hit on any of these high draft picks at defensive end. Like Marcus Davenport, you know he he's up there. Uh, uh, yeah, he, hey, he's a Viking man. Yeah, he's, he's a Viking. Min- yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's in Minnesota's uh, tra- tra- training room this year uh, instead of the one. Uh, actually, Oregon. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. Thriving there. Yeah, <laughs> he, he's killing it in the in the cold tub. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, Peyton Turner is also on IR for, for, for you know quite a while. Uh, December at the soonest is, is the word on him before he'll be able to return. Um, Isaiah, Isaiah Foskey has not been able to play much, uh, and he's also hurt right now, so he's going to miss this game with a quad issue. Um, they, they just they don't have any edge rush really. The, the one you know the one active player they have off the edge is Carl Granderson. Uh, you know who's uh where's he from he's from wyoming i think yeah he's wyoming. Um, yeah, yeah real yeah. real awkward situation coming out of wyoming oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um but he, he's like their only real like pass rusher off, off the edge cam jordan is he's getting the pressures but he's not finishing with sacks he, he just he doesn't have that closing speed that he used to and so that that's been a problem um the, the, it, it's rough up front you know brian brzee has, has been a good player he, he, he's he's closing in on the team record for uh, passes batted at the line of scrimmage. He's already up to five, and he needs uh, two more to, to, to tie it. So, Brzee, even even when he's not really getting home, uh, he has he has a sack and a half. He's got like 14, 15 pressures this year, I think. Uh, even when he's not getting home, he's doing a really great job of getting his hands up, plugging those passing lanes, and, and trying to find a way to make an impact. So, he, he he's a bit vulnerable against the run, and honestly, that's the story for this whole team, like this whole defense is that they are a very soft run defense. They That's not going to, don't worry about that. That's not gonna oh, okay, cool, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, Joshua Dobbs, uh, he's he's nice with it, but the Alexander good, Madison right? is not, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, I just watched uh, Tyson Badgett run for 70, so it's it's like, oh, gosh. Oh, yeah, okay, well, th- uh, that might be there. I don't know, man, this guy is completely new. I don't think he knows who he is, so. Yeah. Uh, um, hey, so I'm I'm noticing something. Mm-hmm. There's like a lot of Jets on this team, like a lot. <laughs> yeah, Nathan Shepard, uh, Jets legend. Um, yeah, dude, I loved him so. I think it was a third round pick. I loved him so much in that draft. Insane testing numbers. Looked really good at the Senior Bowl. Like really yeah. good. Like killed the hoops. Was uh, he the one who had to leave on like the last day because his wife was giving birth or something? Was that him? No, or I think that? I think that was someone else. That okay. actually might have been Colin Saunders. Actually, like it might have been the oh, other guy. It was. Yeah, yeah, dude. yeah dude, that was <laughs> wild. Yeah, um, but you got you got Nathan Shepard, um, Kyle Phillips, not the receiver, also from the Jets. Mm. Demario Davis, uh, longtime Jet. Uh, Marcus May, somebody. I I, mean, I feel like the Jets kind of screwed that up. Yeah. They didn't even want him. Uh, that's <laughs> um, weird. It's that's, that's a lot of. I'm sure I'm missing something. That's a lot of Jets. Yeah, and I've looked into that, and there there aren't any like. There's no. There's no. <laughs> But yeah, well, it's it's. I have no explanation because I've looked into this and I'm like, okay, are there any connections to like you know the previous coaching staff or the scouting department? No, it's just just a weird coincidence. So I'm guessing that they do value a lot with similar like you know athletic prototypes and um, maybe college backgrounds, things like that. Uh, and, and there just happens to be a lot of overlap there. Uh, but it's a it's a really odd quirk for sure. 
I, I can't imagine. So obviously the Jets are like good now, or mm-hmm. you know, from a roster perspective, I should say, yeah. last two years, right? But before that, I mean that these guys were signed before that. I can't imagine a good heuristic would be, oh, he played for the Jets. Oh, one hundred percent, I want that guy. <laughs> Well, he, right, he, he played for the 2019 Jets specifically. Oh, yeah, that was a good year for them. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, like these guys are like pretty good. It seems like so I don't know anything about Kyle Phillips, but like these guys are like pretty good. Obviously, Nathan Shepard is not like Quinn and Williams or anything, but Demario Davis is killing it. Marcus May is pretty good. Again, I don't really understand what happened there. Like I, I don't know, kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit the linebackers. We already talked about. You know, Demario Davis is great. Pete Warner's going to take over. What is Zach Bond's role? Oh, God. So <laughs> this has been, man, the, the 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 wars that have been waged on Saints Twitter over the Zach Bond. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad I waited into this. Yeah. So, okay. So when the Saints drafted Zach Bond, he was this, you know, the sack artist from Wisconsin who, who was just killing it in, in the Big Ten, lining up on the line of scrimmage and rushing against left tackles, putting them in the dirt and making plays. And the night I, I can I remember the night they drafted him, they had the the position coach uh, get on the conference call, and he was talking about it, and he says, "Yeah, man, we, you know we really see him as more of an off the ball linebacker who can play all three spots." And we're all looking at each other like, "Okay, but he's never done that before. Like that's not that's not in his game tape. He is literally never. He's never. He doesn't. He doesn't know how to backpedal. Like that. That's not in his bag." And the Saints spent the next two and a half years teaching him how to play off-ball linebacker. And he's been primarily a special teams player. He, he, he only gets in when, when they do play their base defense for like 18 or 20 snaps a game um, as the strong sidebacker. And even then, he, he has more reps in coverage than he does rushing the passer. And the Saints have been, you know, fiending for, a, to, for somebody who can sack the quarterback. And they just refuse to let this guy do it. They refuse to do it. And that, that that's probably that's one of my biggest gripes with Dennis Allen as a defensive coach is he is so stubborn about his prototypes at defensive end. He he wants them to be too, he wants too to be huge. Like, these guys are like huge defensive ends. Cameron Jordan's big, mm-hmm. Davenport's big. I think Granderson's kind of big, but like Fosky's yeah. kind of big. Dude, their um, average weight, their their average size is six four two sixty eight at defensive end uh, with among the players on the roster right now. Right, Tanner uh, Passano played like interior for the Chiefs. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. Like, well, yeah. I guess Cameron Jordan kind of plays the interior, honestly. Mm-hmm. For, <laughs> right, if we're well, being they move, yeah. they move around, but yeah. yeah, and but DA is so you know stuck in this. You well, know, exactly. So for context, Zach Bond, like I think he weighed two twenty five at the combine. Like, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, like, he, he's up around like two thirty five, two forty now, I think. But even even then. That that's forty pounds underweight for a defensive end in the system. So he so they look at him as, as a as a space linebacker more than anything, and that's been so frustrating because you're like, okay, we ha- so we have a guy who, who who was a highly effective you know pass rusher in college, and we're not going to let him do that when that's our biggest flaw as a team right now, and that that's kind of been the issue for the last you know for the last four years ever since they drafted him and. And it, it, and it goes back to that system. They, they want these oversized defensive ends who are natural run stoppers, who, again, we're, we're, we're bet, the DA is, is betting that the secondary can buy four or five seconds for them to get home and then make the play. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it is the most frustrating thing to watch because I swear no team has more like almost sacks than the Saints team has had over the last few years. Like, where they're just a step slow to, to bring down the passer and he gets and he gets the ball out. And it was all for nothing. And I swear it just happens over and over again. And, you know, Zach Ballin has kind of found himself at the middle of that argument in, or, or complaint or whatever uh, because of how the Saints have used him. All right. I'm 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 glad we covered that. So they wanted him to be Anthony Barr. Got it. <laughs> um, Anthony Barr, like, Six five, two hundred sixty coming yeah. out. Of the draft. Yeah, and then they tried to get Anthony Barr, and then he decided he was too good for him, and then that 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 that, that whole that whole thing blew up this summer. Um, well, <laughs> they leaked that. Well, they, they, they leaked another out. kind of jet, by the way. Anthony Barr was a oh, jet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he <laughs> left him, him up the altar, right? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. He like he agreed to terms, and he's like, I sorry, I just miss Eric Kendricks too much. Yeah, <laughs> very cute. I get it. I love Eric Kendricks, man. Like yeah. like he, he, he was he, he's who I wanted instead of Steph, instead of Stephon Anthony, and that and that uh was that 2015 draft, I think. Yeah, hey, um, Stephon Anthony looked good as a rookie. Yeah, and then it turned That's out. Oh my god. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah, then you got Rob Ryan, and it, it all blew up. <laughs> um, okay, well, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about this uh, the secondary. So Paul Sandebo, he's picked off some pretty bad quarterbacks. I just has he been good against good quarterbacks? What's the I look? He was just so bad last year. I just have so much trouble with this. I totally get it. Like I've been so critical of of, of his play. Um, he's so high variance. Where, like. It, it, it's like he's always competing for the catch and then 75% of the time he loses. Like, like it's like, he's always right there and, and then the ball gets away from him and he's got, he's had some good breaks. Uh, he, he, he's had, obviously he had the two interceptions uh, off of Badgent, uh, but then he had a pick the week before too. But I mean, he's always had really great numbers with passes defense. He's already up to 11 this year. He had seven last year, eight year before he had, it was, it was something ridiculous at Stanford. He had like 20 something passes defense in only like 14 games or something. It, it, was, it was ridiculous at college. And we've all, and we've kind of been waiting for that to materialize at, at the pro level. And it finally has, and he's playing some really good football right now. He hasn't been penalized at all in, in, in the last two games. Um, after, you know, and even though he does still lead the team in yards allowed on defensive pass interference penalties. Uh, so, so, if it gets to a point where you need a first down, uh, just just kind of throw it in his direction, and maybe you'll, maybe you'll get a reputation penalty or something. I don't know, um, but that, that he, Josh Dobbs reputation. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he he's like the. Um, I'm trying to think of how to put this politely. He's the. Uh, what do you think? You don't gotta be polite. Yeah, yeah. Well, hang on. I want to make sure I get this right. Who's the Cowboys corner who got hurt? Um, Trevon Diggs, the, the gambler. Um, yeah, Trayvon Diggs. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Trayvon Diggs. So he he's Trayvon Diggs. Excuse me. He he he's like the you know the uh, the great value brand version of uh, Trayvon Diggs, wh- where it's either a huge play or it's disaster or 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 a big penalty or or, or an interception or something. Um, to his credit, Adebo has not allowed a touchdown in coverage this season. Um, and and again, he has he's done he's played really clean, very productive football the last few weeks. So. I think his arrow is trending up in the right direction. I do think this will be a good test for him because, you know, I like Josh Dobbs. I, 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 could, I could see him picking on a Debo a little bit uh, if um, if he gets if matched against up with Jordan Addison. Receiving powerhouses, uh, <laughs> Brandon Powell and Jordan Addison, I guess. I mean, hey, yeah. That, that's, Jordan, that's, get... that's Jordan seven touchdowns in nine games, Addison. To use yeah, he's, he's doing all right, but, you know, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. – <laughs> the receiving core is not, you know, what it was like three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Tyron is still playing at like a pretty high Tyron Matthew level. How's he, how's he, he's like back in Louisiana and like kind of one of the deals for him coming out was that he probably shouldn't mm-hmm. be in Louisiana. Yeah. Right? And like, yeah. And he, he still is kind of keeping things at arm's length. Like he, he doesn't live in New Orleans. He, he, I don't know if you're familiar with the geography down there. He, he lives on the other side of Lake Bonchett train in Seidel. And so, so he's, he's not, you know, go, mixing it up in the same, you know, communities and with the same influences that he may have had when, when th- things were rough for him or, or, or earlier in life. So, so he, it's, he's very much a more, you know, a more mature, like grown up person now than he was before. And, and he, he, he's very much a leader for this team. That's good. That's good. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. What are the, or maybe one of the better stories, I think, in the NFL, just in terms of like players right. being able to find themselves. I love it. Yeah, and, uh, you, and then, you talk about like fan favorites, like 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 uh, his jersey sold out in like fifteen seconds. It literally it does cra- not shock me at all. It, 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 cra- <laughs> it crashed uh, the the NFL website. I, I remember uh, the, the NFL shop. I mean, it, it crashed whenever they first released his jersey. It was it was wild. That rules, man. That rules. I'm so happy for him. Me too. Uh, Alante Taylor, like, you know, you talk about how, how good he's been in the slot, how good of a pick he was last year. Can you tell me just a little bit about him in general? Yeah, so he's someone else who's been working really hard. Uh, he hadn't played the slot at all in college or last year. And then he, the, in training, literally in training camp, that's when they started working with him in, in, in the slot uh, this this summer. 
and he's been really receptive to, to that role and into coaching, and he, he's coming along well. He, he's not, I think, he, he's he's not being targeted as heavily now as he was earlier to start the year, and I, I think that's a testament to the work he's put in. Um, something that's interesting, too, is he, he re- probably his biggest flaw as a defender last season was missing tackles. Um, and and they, there was it was so dynamic watching it because it, nobody misses nobody missed tackles more impressively than he did last year. I'm talking like <laughs> arms and legs are flying everywhere. Um, you know, there's an explosion in the background. Like like it, it was wild. And <laughs> it, it was like a diehard movie or something. Every time he would miss a tackle, it, it was just it was spectacular. And this year he's really cut down on it. And he he's been a great space player for the Saints. He, he's come up. With, with some really nice tackles out in the flats and at, you know, at and behind the line of scrimmage. Um, let see here. What, what are his tackles? Yeah. He already has four tackles for loss right now. He has the third most tackles for loss on the team right now. Um, he, he has been an at a legitimate asset for the saints. And that's been really cool to see because we were, you know, there was a lot of skepticism that he would be able to not only, you know, pick up this, this uh, new role in, in the defense, uh, but that he would be able to to stay there and play at a high level, and it, that was kind of like the the, uh, the the counterpart to Trevor Pinning over the over the summer. Uh, okay, we're we're putting this young guy in a new role, new second year pro, putting him in in, in a spot that he ha- doesn't have a lot of experience with. How, how's he going to respond? And Taylor has responded really well, and you know, he, well enough to where the Saints cut Bradley Roby at, at, at the at, uh, when they let him go during roster cuts at the last minute. So. He's playing really well. Uh, he's got eight passes defense. Uh, that's second on the team. Um, he, he's very much an impact player for the Saints. All right. The, the rules. Um, so the special teams unit, I'm not familiar with these names at all. I'm like really used to being like, yeah, Thomas Morstead and Will Lutz, you know, old reliables. Yeah. And, these and, guys? and they sure are reliable for their new teams, aren't they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I man. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Well, I guess Lou Headley seems to. I can probably figure that out. Blake Group Groupie, yeah. Gr- Gr- Groupie. Groupie does not. He does not have as many groupies now as he did earlier in the season. But yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Take taking the low hanging fruit there. Um, so Groupie has been under under fire. Uh, he he he's missed some pretty high profile kicks. He missed the game winner against the Packers uh, early, early this year. Uh, he had a missed kick against uh, against the Bears that that would have made a, two, a two score game. Um, he, he's really been struggling, and you, you hate to see that for a young, for a young guy, uh, especially this early in his career. But that's just the reality of it. He, he he's been too erratic. He pushes a lot of kicks wide right of the sticks. Um, that seems to be his main issue is when he, when he's lined up on that right hash, and. He, he's overcorrected at times, and it's it's just it's not been as steady. It has not been the the upgrade from Will Lutz that you know Dennis Allen r- really tried to sell him as when when they made that change uh, there at the end of preseason. So that, that's been a problem. Lou Headley, uh, are, are you familiar with, with the legend of Lou Headley at all? Uh, no, it sounds like a name I've heard in a country song. Love it. All right, so Lou Headley is a thirty year old uh, man from Australia. What? Oh my God! Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so he was working in a scaffolding and roofing um, in, in his twenties uh, in, in Western Australia. Uh, he, at one point, he owned a oh, Western Australia. That's wow. Okay, this guy's yeah. like rough and tumble, dude. He's from he he's from a fishing town of five thousand people on the west coast in in, uh, in Australia. Like like he's he's from the sticks, man. Uh, he, 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 he's from geographically speaking, he, he and he and I are from a very similar territory. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. And, um, but he is a, just a, a wild story. So, so he's got tattoos from his, from his, his chin to his feet. Uh, he owned a, ta- he, he was the part owner of a tattoo parlor in Bali for a few years. Um, he sold Bali it. the country. All yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. They're in the South Pacific, man. He, he owned a tattoo parlor for a few years. He sold it to finance his move to San Francisco uh, so that he could go to college at, at you know, I, th- I think I think it's San Francisco City College, I think. Um, and so he, he could pick up, you know, American style football because he had played um, Aussie rules, uh, you know, when, when he was younger. Mm-hmm. And I guess he got tired of scaffolding all day. And he's like, let me go try something else. So he did this. And Worked out well enough to where he got a scholarship offer from from the Miami Hurricanes, and he he was just a fan favorite in that program for for, for, for several years. The Saints signed him as, as an undrafted free agent. My, my, 
Now, all of these details are wonderful, and they, they, they paint just a just a lovely picture. He's, it yeah. sounds like you're about to tell me he's not very good. Oh no, no, he he's been improving. Uh, but I'll, but before we get into like the the actual you know the football side that people are listening to this for, my favorite detail about this is that ESPN had to change his age um, after he got drafted because he was he was listed as being 28 years old going into the draft, and it turns mm-hmm. out he's actually 30. So he so he's too, so I don't know if that was a clerical error or what? if he was like. Or if he was maybe like hiding his, trying to hide his age or something. I, I yeah, don't know. Right, lied. Yeah, that would rule. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, Do I, I hope? You know, I hope he lied. That's so much funnier. It is. It is. It, it's like okay, maybe. It, yeah, nobody. Nobody's going to sign a thirty-year-old rookie, but maybe a twenty-eight-year-old rookie. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe someone's going to Brandon Weed in the bit, but thirty. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and th- that's just the, the perfect like. You know, rough and tumble, you know, scruffy Australian guy rolling into town, like 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 detail to the story. It's wonderful. Um, but as far as him as a punter, he, he he's he he's been improving pretty rapidly. So he really what he most struggled with early in the season was his hang time. Uh, he had like the thirtieth out of thirty two ranked hang time at one point. I think well to, through the first few weeks, and then at one point he had the lowest. He was averaging like four like three point eight seconds of hang time or something. It, it, it was a problem. And he's really been working at that, and it's helped the Saints in, in, in a big way. Um, accuracy has been getting there as well. Um, unfortunately, the Saints offense has had to punt very often <laughs> this year. Uh, the good news is that Headley and, and the punt coverage unit have worked really well at, at you know pretty consistently dropping uh, punts inside the, the twenty in the, inside the red zone. And he, he's he's I feel much better about his long term you know status. Uh, than I do groupie at this stage. Okay, so I just I looked up the hang times. So first of all, every like the the two players with the fastest, so worst hang times, mm-hmm. uh, are like non-American, right? So you've got the Scottish Hammer, Jamie Gillen. Yeah, you got Lou Headley at three point nine nine seconds. So I looked. You mentioned he's improving it. I looked at the last four weeks, and it's it's worse. It's three point nine two seconds. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> my, credi- my credibility it's gone um, well look look well then maybe, maybe the saints are doing something differently with their punt coverage teams but but they yeah, definitely that could be it. Okay. yeah they, they, but they are doing a much better job getting downfield you know stopping those punts inside the 20 and, and kind of winning that field position battle so so maybe they're adjusting to it but there, there's got to be something to these you know that, that all sees that international style kicking whether it's from rugby or Aussie rules football or whatever it may be. I, I think that, I think there's probably a, a bigger adjustment to that than a lot of people like to think. Yeah. It looks like uh, last four weeks, 10 of 15 were either downed or fair caught, which is like, that's a 10 of 15 is like pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and over the course of the season, it's, it's 20 of like, you mentioned there's a lot of punts, 43 punts. So yeah, yeah you know, the, there must be something in the coverage that has improved, but yeah, the average hang time is not beautiful. I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize that as like very wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that was definitely like a point of emphasis earlier on. So I, I guess they're just finding a way to work around it for now. Yeah, a lot of a lot of these international punters, man. I can't find anybody besides like Brad Wing, which I mean, he doesn't count. He's been in the NFL forever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the rest of these the rest of these guys are all all American. Good old American putters. Yeah, oh, bro, blue collar. <laughs> Some blue collar. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to get those H one B visas or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, so what burns me up is that the Saints, you know, they cut Thomas Morstead last year in order to no the year before last in order to promote the guy that he had been training to replace him was Blake Gilligan, uh, Penn State legend. Um, and Gil- Gilligan kind of played himself out of the job last season where, where he was erratic. He was not working. He was, he, was, he, he regressed quite a bit after, after playing at a pretty high level the year before. Uh, but, but he took a step back last year and then the Saints liked what they saw from Headley in camp enough to make a change. And last I checked, uh, Blake was with the Cardinals and, performing decently i, I don't know. I, I try not to watch a lot of cardinals games i'll wait until they get um until they get um uh, drake may or one of these quarterbacks um but <clears throat> it's like it's like well now that josh dobbs isn't there anymore yeah <laughs> man um 
but it's like, man, did we, did we really need to let Thomas Morstead go? Because he, he's out here having like, you know, just, just tearful, like reminiscing with the jets and j- just being this, this great dude that we, that he's known to be within the, org- within the saints organization. And it's like, man, we, we may have botched that one, Sean. Uh, th- thank you, Sean Baton for, for kicking our, um you know, our, our, our decades long, uh, Fan favorite punter out the door before you quit on us. So that that, that was great, masterful gambit, sir. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, so I, I think I think we cover basically everything. Um, I for, I don't know who's. I assume the Saints are favored because the Vikings have a backup quarterback. I bet it's like three points or something. Yeah, it was, it was um, three and a half when I was looking at it earlier. So I feel very smart now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I, okay, I did have to look at the spreads earlier today for for a podcast, so I'm sure I just remembered it. But no, I'm going to say that I felt that one out. Um, I, I wouldn't doubt you for a second. <laughs> what? Uh, how do you think the game's going? Give us a game prediction. Yeah, so let me think. I'm not super worried about the Vikings' passing attack, um, just ma- mainly because Justin Ooh. Jefferson's not playing, and you know. He, he took Marshawn Lattimore's lunch money last year, so that's one less thing to worry about. Um, Josh Dobbs, his, his running ability does give me pause because that's like the one thing the Saints have just not been able to figure out in, over the last few years is these rush these quarterbacks who, who, who can run and who, who are competent runners and who are not just, you know, like scrambling on a whim and taking off for, for one or two plays a game, but guys, guys who continue to go back to that. And I, I can I can totally see Dobbs just running amok and making making plays and outrunning you know thirty four year old Cam Jordan and thirty three year old Demario Davis and you know Juken Tyron Matthew out of his cleats and I, I can absolutely see this being a problem and so that that gives me pause but and defensively I don't like the matchup where the Vikings have this really blitz heavy defense. Um, which, which obviously you know more about that than I do and, and why, why they're doing that. But Derek Carr specifically doesn't respond well under under pressure and having a lot of bodies around him in the pocket. And so I don't yeah, think... That's, that's been like the book on him since he was like a, at Fresno State. That's like the yeah. whole deal with him. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so, I mean, maybe maybe it's PTSD from watching his brother get beaten up at, with, with the Texans. I don't know. But, that's what um, people keep saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is a... Hey, I don't want to downplay generational trauma. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so I, I, I'm not looking for a ton of points here. Um, to, to me, this smacks of like a, like, like a Saints 20 Vikings 18 type of type of final score. Like, like, I think it'll be close just, just because I don't think Carr is going to respond well to having all that pressure in his face. And that may slow down the offense after a couple of pretty encouraging games. So at the same time, the Vikings could could get some mismatches with with the Saints in, in space. Um, you know they just they have all of these you know older slower defenders in starting roles right now, and I, I think that's a problem against a quarterback with, with, who can scoot. And to me that that looks like a concern. So I, I'll I'll take the three points or whatever it is, and I, I think the Saints are going to pull away with a win, uh, j- just because I just because I do think the talent discrepancy is on their side here on both sides of the ball. Um, but I'm not expecting it to be a blowout or like a you know a statement win for the Saints or anything like that. All right, cool. Well, uh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being wrong about that. Uh, always appreciate <laughs> <laughs> that and the, uh, the the punting hang time thing. That that, that, yeah, man, that's that rough. and that yeah. and the Jawan Johnson thing. Like like my my, my record <laughs> is in the mud this year. All right, uh, disgraced Saints writer John Ziegler. <laughs> where can people find you? Oh man! Look, you guys can you guys can keep up with me on um, X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, at uh, at John underscore S I G L E R R. Two R's. The first one was stolen, and Daddy Elon never freed it up for me. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> but and then you can also find all of our coverage at uh, SaintsWire dot com, part of the USA Today NFL Wires Network. Uh, Arif, thanks again for having me on the show. It's, it's been a great time, man. Yeah, no worries, man. Thanks for coming on. Of course, anytime. All right, let's go to the mailbag. And the first question is from El Presidente. It says, while keeping the viral video of a Vikings fan shaving his eyebrows in support or excitement over Joshua Dobbs' performance last weekend, 
what other extreme actions can Vikings fans take to support their favorite Vikings players? Example, buying a Porsche and driving at 130 miles an hour. I'm going to include on Highway 62. Uh, discuss. <laughs> yeah, first of all, that'd be a Lambo and it'd be 140 miles per hour. Not that that I would like recommend. I'm, that's not me saying you should do that. I'm just, for the purposes of a more accurate joke. we're both of the belief of the futurama quote that it's better to be technically correct because technically correct is the best kind of correct yeah yeah um i think uh it doesn't have to be something as extravagant as that you could always boat in lake minnetonka you could run through okra patches um (laughs) (laughs) there's all kinds of activities you could do to support the Vikings. <laughs> you know, sometimes you got to run through the okra patch. I'm just, you know. Just got to um, run through the okra patch. <laughs> Brian McKinney was right. Uh, 50, year old, 50 years Vikings fan asks, do the Saints put a spy on Dobbs and open up the middle of the field? Um, I think that they probably would because, first of all, uh, as Sigler pointed out, like the Saints have had uh, some issues not just against the run but against running quarterbacks specifically, which is kind of interesting because they've got like the world's best scout team quarterback in Taysom Hill for that perspective. But um, I would think so. Uh, but I don't know that that would necessarily open up the middle of the field because very often a quarterback spy is also handling – kind of intermediate zone duties, but they do have to be a little bit late to to respond to stuff. So um, it'll create, you know, some opportunities, but I think it's going to open up a little bit further downfield um, and it's going to make play action maybe a little bit more effective. Um, so that's probably the direction that you're going to be headed in. But I, I do think that that's probably something the Saints will want to consider. Quarterback spies are just not that common anymore. Typically, the ability to stop a quarterback run is incorporated into the structure of the defense in a number of ways, but uh, we like that's just not something the Saints are doing very well despite having an otherwise really effective defense. So how does Taysom Hill score on the Vikings? Like, what's the uh, weird, mean, dumb way that you, he does it? You, you say that as if there's only one way that he... <laughs> I, I, I'm saying, how, what's the dumb, weird way this time that, that it happens? Oh, okay. So instead of um, like a 40-yard bomb like last time, um, the the worst, I think, is uh, you know, he takes a snap to drop back to pass, hits a lineman in the helmet with the ball, catches it, and then runs for 40 yards. That's the worst scenario. I was going to say he trucks uh, Daniil Hunter. On his way uh, d- in. These are not mutually exclusive. They can happen <laughs> on the same these, play. Yeah, this absolutely could happen. Oh, no. Yep, this is... Uh, the, few players play better against the Vikings, or the Vikings make better than uh, than Taysom Hill. That's just the way it works. Yeah, qu- quarterbacks awful. with athletic activity in general, but Taysom Hill specifically. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, Joe Glissick asks, For a Reef's playbook corner... Now with a week of reps under Dobbs' belt, how different will Kevin O'Connell's play calling be? Or will he try to emulate what he did against the Falcons again because it worked so well? Um, I wouldn't shock me if there were some RPO elements, some zone read elements. You do have to be a little bit careful. We talked about this a little bit on the Minnesota football party with Ron Johnson. He mentioned that, you know, if you're going to install zone read, you have to you know, really build up like genuine like chemistry with the running back because you have to hold the mesh point and the running back has to know when they can grab onto the ball, how long the quarterback's going to hold the ball at the mesh before pulling it back, that kind of thing. Like that's something to consider. But I think that that would be pretty smart because, you know, obviously Dobbs has the ability to gain on the ground in a way that Cousins wouldn't. So that's something um, I think moving pocket in general. So um the play actions are going to be like bootlegs. Although one would have hoped that that was already in the offense because a, that's, that's the kind of offense that Kevin O'Connell has designed, you know, with LA, but B, you know, that's something that cousins is like very comfortable with like historically. So you would have wanted that anyway, but because it puts Dobbs on the move, you know, it's something that you'd really want to emphasize. So I think it's, it's going to be, you know, stuff that moves the pocket around stuff that takes advantage of his ability to gain positive yardage from the line of scrimmage. I think those are probably the changes. I think that the the like the passing design is probably not going to change too much aside from the play action stuff. I think that you're still going to have those those deeper shots. You're not going to have as many intermediate or short routes. The Vikings just right now don't um, have that many in their offense. It's a lot of intermediate and deep instead of intermediate and short. 
Uh, and um, I think they're going to keep that. Um, so I think that's probably going to stay the same. I think it's a lot of it's just going to focus on finding ways to get Dobbs himself into space and simplify his reads. Next question is going to be from Kevin Sayer, who asks, how sustainable is the blitzing? Is Flores doing it uh, as we don't have like a credible pass rushing threat outside of Hunter and the cornerbacks are somewhat inexperienced? Or do the players we have lend themselves well to this type of scheme? Or is it like all these things uh, that's somewhere in the middle? Um, so I think that the, the like one, I don't even know if it's a misconception or misunderstanding because I haven't seen a lot of people talk about it like this. But one thing that people kind of need to know is that it's not like it's a normal defense and they just add a bunch of blitzing to it. Blitzing is incorporated within the design of the defense. How often they blitz is a core feature of the way that that defense is structured. And so you're consistently going to have six, seven, maybe even eight players at the line of scrimmage and how the uh, coverage lines up, where run fits are, all of that is built around that idea that um, you're going to have six, seven around the line of scrimmage, at least five, right? Uh, And those five are interchangeable. And so if you look at, and I wrote about this in my um, Blitz Magic piece over at the Substack, um, if you look at the way some of these playbooks are built in the Brian Flores defense, in uh, of the five players at the line of scrimmage, instead of saying, you know, this is our, you know, um, Jack linebacker, this is, an, uh, this is a defensive end, this is a nose tackle, um, they all, instead of giving a position designation, they all just have the letter X. And all of them have to learn each other's positions so that they can switch at any moment and play a different spot on the line and kind of understand what their job is supposed to be. So it's built in the design of the defense. Now, obviously, they're blitzing more than previous Brian Flores defenses, right? So it's not as if we're just porting one defense onto another. There is a difference here. Um, One thing that I've been saying a little bit, I said this in the interview with Charles McDonald, I said it on Twitter to Luke Braun. Um, One thing to keep in mind is that like the defense is like kind of madman crazy. Uh, The Vikings by far, and I think Benjamin Solak tweeted this out, by far lead the league not even close in six plus person pressures. So they send six or more like over 20% of the time, like second place is like 5%. It's crazy how often they send six. And I said to Luke Broad, who like I quote tweeted that it's six or three, the Vikings sent six. So they send three. They very like relative to the rest of the league. They rarely send to four, um, which is weird and cool but also like part of the way that that defense is designed. It's meant to complicate the looks for quarterbacks made to meant to make the protections look a little bit weird. I've noted that it seems to do a pretty good job of exploiting inexperienced quarterbacks more than it does anything else, because it's kind of dependent on, you know, forcing quarterbacks to sift through visual trash. Um, But it is, it is a core part of the defense. So I don't like from that perspective, I think that there is some level of sustainability to it. I don't know if it's going to be very good against good quarterbacks. So that's keep that in mind, but it is built into the design of the defense, the way that they, the way that they set players. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's something to be said there about it being a high variance defense and kind of losing some of its uh, capacity against better quarterbacks, but that's part of it. Now, is it that they don't have a credible pass rush outside of Hunter? I think they would probably blitz a little bit less if they had a better front four in terms of pass rushing, but I still think they'd be among the league leaders in blitzing. Like I think that that was always going to be the case. It's just, is that at 40% or is it at like 50%? Like that's the difference, right? Um, uh, is it that the cornerbacks are somewhat inexperienced? Nope. It's a core feature of the, of the, of the defense. We've seen that when Flores had like Xavier Howard, right? So that's just, that's just what it is. I mean, when he had Stephon Gilmore in New England, like that, that guy is like pretty good and pretty experienced. Um, but yeah, it's it's there, there are differences that they're adjusting for the talents that the Vikings have, but it the core of the defense is the same, kind of regardless of how talented those players are. Next question is going to be from Charles Wrights, who ask who asks uh, regarding scrambles. Will Dobbs and Hall's tendency toward more pocket movement than Cousins spur many changes to the passing game plan, or does what we already have adapt onto uh, that reasonably well? With the way that Kirk was playing, the movement clearly wasn't necessary per se, but 
is it a useful modifier to the existing passing attack or something that either necessitates or lends itself well to a change? So in terms of pocket movement, I mean, there's a couple of different kinds of pocket movement we have to talk about. Like Brady, for example, is not known as a mobile quarterback, but he's a really good pocket movement quarterback. He makes small moves within the pocket that like substantially increase um, his time in the pocket and his platform, right? That, that allows him to throw. So that is, it's, it's something to kind of keep in mind is that there's multiple types of pocket movement. Um, the offense has within it a way to move the pocket and a way to keep the quarterback moving. Um, it's just, it's based off of, you know, bootleg play action, something that's built into the offense. They just haven't done it that much. And it, I don't think it's because Kirk Cousins, um, you know, isn't very mobile because he's done a very good job on bootlegs in the past. I think it's because the Vikings don't see themselves as being able to run play action all that often without a credible running threat. And I disagree with them, but it, it, that's a, it's a pretty common view that if you can't run the ball very well, you can't do play action very well. Um, there is something to be said about having to punish, you know, teams that don't bite on play action by actually running the ball. I mean, I think that there is in effect that is not captured by the data that we have, but I think that you can't overcorrect for a bad running game by refusing to run play action all that often. I still think it's something that you should do. Um, so it, it is, it is built into the game plan, but I do think that there are ways, like I mentioned in the answer to, um, 50 years Vikings fan. I do think that there are additional ways to take advantage of the mobility of both Jaron Hall and Joshua Dobbs that incorporates the use of stuff like RPOs and zone reads that allows the quarterback to either threaten to run or to run. So um, that's something that they should, I think, do. They already had RPOs in the offense, uh, and so that mesh point stuff could um, potentially be partially resolved by, by, by that fact, by the fact that the running backs are a little bit used to that already. Um, but it's still a, a little bit of a different game to to include a quarterback run in that. But I, I do think that they should. Next question is going to be from Captain Rhyme, who asks, how do we rank Vikings rivalries now that Peyton isn't in New Orleans and the Lions are good? Yeah, so one thing I was kind of surprised by is that Sigler agreed with me at the end of the interview. Sigler agreed with me that the karmic debt that the that the Saints of the Vikings has not yet been paid off by the persistent playoff losses. So we agree on that, which is great. Um, which means it's still part of the rivalry, right? So it's still up there. I think that you're right that it it, it drops down rankings like it's below the Packers, right? Um, but I'd say it's still above the Eagles. I think the Eagles perceive the Vikings hatred of the Eagles to be larger than it actually is. Um, it's still there, right? You know, screw them. But uh it's I, I still think it ranks above the Eagles. Um, so yeah, the Packers are up there. I don't actually think the Lions are there yet. I think like for rivalries to happen, right? Like obviously playing each other a lot helps in a big way, right? But I think for rivalries to happen, it needs to be games that are close, are high stakes, and are controversial in some way, right? And I don't necessarily mean controversial in that the outcome is disputed. Like, oh, I could, they, they should have like... Um, you know, the, the refs, you know, screwed us, right? They should have called pass interference or whatever. Um, you know, that helps, right? But it's just like, it's one that you talk about a lot. So even before the Bounty Gate stuff came out, right? Like the way that the 2009 NFC Championship game had played out, with, like drew a lot of polemics, drew a lot of argumentation, drew a lot of like everything, right? Um, so I think that that's part of it. That said, you know, like random other stuff plays a role, like fan behavior, right? Like the Eagles stuff, right? That's one game. It wasn't close. It was very high stakes, but it wasn't close. I'd argue it wasn't the game itself wasn't necessarily controversial, but it did draw some polemics. So maybe by the definition I'm using, it was. But like fan behavior absolutely played a big role in how much Vikings fans resented the Eagles and Eagles fans, right? So um, that that I think plays a role. Um, it's it's like a lot, right? Like what your expectations are going in plays a role. Like I think the Vikings um, could have generated a um, rivalry against the 49ers if, you know, in recent years in the playoffs, they had beaten the 49ers once or twice, right? But they, they just got stopped. It kind of doesn't matter. And no one really expects the Vikings to do well, so no one really minds that. Um, but the Vikings were expected to do well in 2017, so that matters. So all of these things matter, right? 
So the Lions rivalry would, and and if the Lions remain good, I think it's almost inevitable, not quite, almost inevitable that these conditions will be met. There's going to be a high stakes game. It's going to have some level of, uh, you know, controversy or polemics associated with it. I don't know if fan behavior is going to play a role, but, you know, they might be close. Those are all going to matter, but they have to happen first. You can't just play each other a lot. So um, the Saints still have that. Um, and I don't know that there's like a ton of other rivalries to point to with the Vikings. Like the Bears are kind of there just because it's really hard for the Vikings to play at Lambeau, but they haven't played a ton of high stakes games against each other. Um, in fact, the opposite. They've played a ton of games that literally just don't matter at all. Uh, and so it's kind of tamped down the rivalry between the Bears and the Vikings. Um, I'm trying to think of like other ones. There was a stretch where the Vikings played the Giants for 11 years in a row and it did not turn into a rivalry. Um, and then there's a stretch where they played the Seahawks a bunch and it kind of a little bit turned into a small rivalry. But yeah, I'm trying to think of like other teams. James, can you think of like besides the ones I named, like other teams that would be in a Vikings rivalry at the moment? Well, because like, I'm not going to add the Cowboys to that. That was like in the 70s. Yeah, the Cowboys thing, it's it, it stopped being it stopped being a rivalry. And yeah, with the now, Lions, it's, now it's just everyone hates the Cowboys. Like that's the level of it. Yeah, and with the Lions, the Lions were so terrible for so long, and we don't know if this Lions thing is sustainable at the moment either. See, the Lions thing is a bit like the Packers to the Vikings because their big rival, if you talk to Packers fans, it, uh, involves the Bears. They don't think about the. They don't really like qualify the Vikings as like being their number one rival. They I think the sometimes they like just say that though. Yeah, to annoy well, Vikings fans. Yeah, I think but, I think I think they get a little bit more joy nowadays out of a Vikings win than out of a Bears win. But I yeah agree that that kind of dynamic is is part of it. Yeah. So as a like the the mirror of that to the Vikings is the Chicago or it's it's not the Chicago thing. It's the it's the Detroit thing. Like yeah, we beat on we beat on Detroit for so long. Like there was like a a good decade where they hadn't like beaten Minnesota, so it's I I can't really put that there. The ones I would think of off the top of my head would involve anywhere Sean Payton is, um, is which Broncos, I suppose now it's the Broncos. Uh, it's more just the Sean Payton aspect of it. Sean yeah. Payton could be a a, a pee wee could be like a pee wee coach somewhere, and like I would still pay to see people just trounce him. Do I have some good news for you, James? <laughs> there so, is this wonderful app. It's called Netflix. Oh, we still need to do the watch on that. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, but like, for me, it's anywhere Sean Payton goes. Um, after that, it's the Eagles and the Saints. Like, I was actually asked the other day by my son that, about the teams I dislike the most, uh, other than like the Packers, which was obvious. And I was like, uh, the Saints. We're, we're, in a, we're in a bit of a lull, right? Yeah, like, like, cause, cause the like, think about the Patriots for example, right? So they were dominant for so long, um, but they did have a rivalry with the Colts, right? Obviously, they the in division rivalries. All three of the in division rivalries were pretty contentious, right? Um, so you get the Bills, the Dolphins, and the Jets, right? Um, and it's not like any of those three teams had a sustained period of being good while the Patriots were good, but they had different moments and they had a bunch of high stakes games and all that. So. So the Patriots had like a bunch, right? And they could have developed one with the Chargers, but they just kept on meeting the Jets in the playoffs instead. Um, but yeah, like the Patriots developed a bunch and I just named four off the top of my head. I'm sure Patriots fans have others that matter a lot more to them. Maybe the Eagles, I don't know. But like, it's like, it's there for the Patriots in a way that like the Vikings just kind of don't, we're just in a lull, right? And the Patriots Colts rivalry is dying. It's like, it's yeah. dying fast. Um, I think it's basically dead. No one played it up. They've got, they're playing in London, and no one played up the rivalry. So um, that might just be gone. Uh, and so the Vikings are just going to have to develop, you know, new rivalries, whether it's with a team that they're constantly playing because they finish at the same spot in the division or whatever. Um, there's there's got to be, you know, and maybe you just have to make the playoffs more often in order for that rivalry to develop. And like you could point to Atlanta if you really wanted to, but it doesn't really like. It, it, that hasn't been a thing for a while. It's just like, oh, well, there was a real big disappointment there once. And every time they play yeah, each other, something it, if, happens. if it had like resurfaced every couple of years, it doesn't have to be that often. But if like five years after that, you know, Atlanta bounced the Vikings out again, and then, you know, five years after that, and then it would be a rivalry, right? But like, 
in the opportunities that that rivalry has had to like grow, it, it really hasn't. And that's a rivalry really needs that. It needs like repeats or like something huge, like Bounty yeah. Gate. Yeah, with the with the Vikings and the Saints, like when the Vikings knocked the Saints out of the playoffs uh, with the Kevin Rudolph or say with the Kyle Rudolph play rather. Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, with the Kyle Rudolph play, it's like, oh yeah. I was about to swear. I was like, yeah, "F those guys!" Like, no, that's that's exactly how, like how a rivalry is supposed to go. Yeah, and yeah, that that one's going to be deeply ingrained this whole generation. But yeah, yeah those like are the ones a, I can a, think a, of. a rivalry absolutely needs like if you beat them, you walk out of that stadium thinking, "Yeah, I hope they feel bad." Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I hope you feel worse, actually. Yeah, <laughs> like, he might have shoved off. I don't know, but I know it wasn't called. Like it turns into that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's go to Iowa Josh, who asks, I get the feeling that this is going to be a repeat of the Baker Mayfield game last year, where he won the game and then studied the playbook and got worse. Is that <laughs> possible here? I mean, like, yeah, it is. Not because studying the playbook is bad, but because Dobbs won through a series of incredibly unsustainable events, right? He missed two open touchdowns, and uh, and one of those plays scored a touchdown with his legs, and another play got a fourth down conversion with his leg like just nuts right but he like open plays available to him and that just doesn't happen that often in the nfl uh and so i i don't think like if dobbs was really that dynamic with his legs on a consistent basis the vikings would have never had him like he would have just he'd just be starting for pittsburgh right like that like that's like the thing so yeah but not because he's learned the playbook Right. But because the ways that he won are probably not ways that he's going to win going forward on a consistent level. So he's going to need to see the the hot route on the nickel blitz, which he missed and turned into a first down conversion or the open tight end in the end zone, which he missed and turned into a touchdown or uh, the open receiver in the end zone, which he missed and turned into a first down conversion. Like you can't do that. Um, And if he knows the playbook, he might miss that less. But he, like he's, he's back up for a reason. Like he's not probably not that good. So yeah, he, it could be like that. Um, Draw play Dave actually on his um, on his site um, talked about backup baller energy. He calls it BBE, and that in the obviously in the Vikings game, Dobbs showed that, but also in the Baker Mayfield game they're referencing, Baker Mayfield showed that it's just a backup who like very strongly thinks like this is their time to shine, and they're not going to hold back, and they're just going to go. 110 percent just you know balls to the wall right so um that that that's how dobbs plays and sometimes that like works for you and sometimes it won't so i yeah he'll learn the playbook and get worse but not because he learned the playbook uh let's go to cade who asks for a real matthew hopkins corner Based on the entirety of the 2022 season and last week's game against the Falcons, has Kevin O'Connell done enough to spur the eye of which of the Witchfinder General, uh, of the Witchfinder General, should he be made an example of at at the stake by Roger Goodell? So, so there's like some understanding here that like I know a lot about witch stuff. Um, I don't. I had to Google Matthew Hopkins who is, and turns out, the Witchfinder General. Um, He only ever lived in England. I don't know how I was supposed to know who this dude was, but, like, okay, fine. Um, As you can imagine, he found and hunted witches, um, which is great for him, I guess. Uh, Probably bad. I shouldn't shouldn't say it's great, but, you know, he seems to be having fun. Um, But, yeah, I don't think that Goodell is against witchcraft. Certainly not. I think that the types of things that we see in the NFL on a weekly basis would tell us that Goodell is not against witchcraft. Certainly seems to encourage it. So I don't know that this is going to be something where KOC has to worry about the league. Um, If there are witch finders uh, who take... Um, you know, some level of objection to the way the Vikings handle their business. One would imagine that they'd have done so in, in 2022, and I don't think they did. I think, I think really at this point, witch finding is dead. I think that it's a dead industry. Um, it's much like sports journalism. Maybe AI is going to take over witch finding. I don't know. But primarily, anti-witch action comes from other witches. It's just, it's, it's, it's like 
international relations where <laughs> it's an anarchic system. Everybody regulates each other with displays of power. And the goal is to gain more power. And it's a complex series of chess moves from a bunch of different witches or countries, whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and the regulation system is kind of it's self-correcting. So it's the witches competing against each other. So that's the, that's the thing. Um, there is no like, like just like how the United Nations has no power, there's no governing body that has power over witches. So that's the thing that you kind of have to keep in mind here. Um, so it's, it's, it's other witches that will handle KOC if they feel like he's a threat. I was gonna say uh, I was gonna mention the baby witches, but I suppose that uh, that's just another organization. Those are, those are like witches. rogue nations. You can you can handle that. They could like they cause a fuss, but you can handle that. You can handle the baby witches. Yeah, I mean it's like like hey, how much of a threat is a rock now? Like it's come on, it's, it's <laughs> the axis of evil has been taken care of, James. Mission accomplished. Uh, Mission let's... accomplished. <laughs> Final question is from Skull Troll, who asks, is a reef considering cease and desist against a uh, draw play Dave at his artwork? Uh, I, this, this would very much dry sand affect me. There's no way <laughs> like, that I would, I would do that. Also, it would really complicate the fact that James commissions his artwork. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, yes, for uh, for for Norse code things, but I have been known to toss tree video. <laughs> yeah, so I wasn't a part so, of the last one. To be fair, I was not a part of the last. Okay, he did it for like thing. fourteen dollars. That was insulting. <laughs> 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 that was crazy. Um, but yeah, so if I drafted a cease and desist, it would need to exclude moments where I specifically ask him to make art again for the show, not the, I did not want the dumpy reef. That's not a thing that I wanted. Um, but like, you know, the, the 10 year anniversary merch, you know, we wanted that. So we, we would have to draft it in a way that did that, but also in a way that if he posted it to Twitter, wouldn't result in way more people looking at the g- picture of the giant. <sighs> I don't, I don't know if I can say just, but I'm going to say, but it sounds stupid but iTunes, I guess, right, of just the fat junk that I've got going on in my trunk, right? Like, I don't, like, more people would look at that. He would, like, if I were him, and I'm not, thankfully, but I would imagine he would do this anyway, and and I received that season desist, I post, it's just a two, you don't even have to, no, no captions for the tweet. The first picture is the season desist, and the second is a picture of the giant cargo shorts and that's those that's it and it would go viral i would lose my mind that's the worst thing i could possibly do (laughs) yeah so join the discord and uh help crowdfund the uh the next arif picture that's not that's not not we don't that's not we don't offer that that's not in our that's not a thing you, yeah, he just shows up on the discord it's happened the last two weeks i had like I, i hadn't checked my phone for like an hour and a half, two hours, and I picked it up, and all hell had broken loose. And I was howling, literally howling with laughter going through uh, the, the the Twitter and the Discord on that. So Sunday night was quite entertaining. Uh, that is going to be it for this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Again, we will be in Denver this coming uh, this, this next weekend over at The Dan Grill, 7 p.m., November 17th, Friday night. Uh, over at uh, over in Denver, Colorado. Arif, what do you personally have to plug? Uh, I don't think I've written anything since we last recorded, uh, aside from stuff for Bolts from the Blue, which is boltsfromtheblue.com. Uh, again, if you're interested in the Chargers for whatever reason, uh, I sent over five questions to uh, Ryan Matthews over Pride of Detroit about the Detroit Lions. Uh, and I've been posting game recaps there. Otherwise, uh, next week, I think, um, I've got a piece uh, coming up about you know, uh, the S2 cognition test and CJ Stroud and whatever, obviously I'll have, um, some stuff about, um, the Vikings, uh, as they play the saints and stuff like that. But yeah, that's over at wildlifepost.substack.com. Um, going to have a couple of things going up and then I've got a plan going forward about increasing the amount of stuff posted there. 
uh, in the next coming weeks. So hopefully uh, people will get um, a little bit more bang for their buck. Well, that's it for this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. We'll be back next week to discuss uh, hopefully the victory over the Saints. But uh, for a brief, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening. And please remember that maybe you should just put that in a garage next time. And uh, we'll be back next week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan of and he can be found at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at Norse Code DN, or my personal account, at Big Mono. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can do so in a few different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse Code and donate there. For $3.50 a month, you get bonus material and more. You can also go to paypal.me slash norsecode for a one-time donation, or you can go to norsecode.threadless.com and pick up some Norse Code merchandise. Any questions or comments that cannot fit in a tweet can be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. Hey, all things are possible through the power of Ben DiNucci.